We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another show. Tommy, how are you, my man? I'm, mate, I'm, I'm always well. I'll let you know if I'm bad, put it that way. Okay, good. So we've got nothing to talk about. <laughs> nothing. Okay. You know what? This has been a great show, mate. And Oh, yep. Sorry, I'm off. <laughs> off we go. Oh, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I'm always well, my friend. I'm always well. Um, how are you? How are you? I'm, we- I'm really well. All the better for seeing you in person, in tangibility and three dimensions, being able to actually touch you, felt, feel you and smell you. Understand me. Hear me. <laughs> yes. It was great. It was great. Yeah. We got caffeinated. For all those uh, listening at home, we got caffeinated yesterday. I had an eggs Benny. Um, you sat there and and watched. I don't know how you did that, but your willpower. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah, right. you, you did everything I didn't. I had a decaf and nothing to eat, and you had a uh, <laughs> a caffeine all the food. I had a caffeine <laughs> Benny. <laughs> I, yes, Benny Benny. Um, look, today we have a marvelous guest on the show. Her name is Natalie Sabag. And just to give you uh, a little bit of an understanding, firstly, Nat, how are you, my dear? Welcome to Body Meets Mind. And thanks. Nice to meet you, Tom, as well. Thanks right for back at you. on your show. Mm. Natty, I, I'm just going to do a quick intro so uh, the folks at home get an understanding of who you are, what your background is. Um, Nat's completed a Bachelor of Clinical Science in 1999, followed by a Master's in Health Science in 2001 at Victoria University. Over the past 20 years, she's worked alongside some notable osteopaths uh, along the eastern side of Australia, from, Lost- from Launceston to Gold Coast and Sydney, before settling back in Melbourne in 2012 from a sporting background of which I can tell you, uh, but I'll get to that later. Natalie has (laughs) enjoyed providing osteopathic care to local sports teams. Hello. Um, Natalie's osteopathic interests have involved down the path of the biodynamics of osteopathy. One uh, subsection, which I'm particularly interested in and have delved a lot of myself into under the guidance of its uh, founder, Dr. James Jealous. Is it Jealous? Yes. And several other osteopath teachers. Natalie uses these principles in her osteopathic, osteopathic treatment. She's also part of a national study group and teachers collective that shares osteopathic uh, uh, wisdom to students and osteopaths alike. Mm. So, uh, there's a lot there uh, to dissect, but I just kind of want to start at the beginning, which kind of just reminded me how we first met, which was uh, you um, uh, being our, our like our massage therapists and physios at my local footy club, which was That's so right. cool when we won the flag. Oh. Yes. By, by one point. All right. Oh. Yes. Okay. And it was again. Interesting. It was against my old team that I used to work for as well. So I was very, it was very emotionally. I remember it was back, I was still studying. So I can't, it was back in the 1900s. <laughs> I'll tell you when it was. It was the 1900s. It was, day, it was days before the Twin Towers went down. Oh, wow. It was what, sorry? It was, sorry, it was days uh, after the, the Twin Towers oh. went down because my, um, so it was like September 14th or something, 2001. 2000, 2001. Mm. Um, yes, yeah, so that's when we first met. You were a, a fresh fit 19-year-old and now you're still a fresh fit something else year old. 41-year-old. 41-year-old. <laughs> and going, some might say strong, oh, some yeah, might not say so strong. Plus years old. Yeah, so that's how we had to, um, while we were studying, we actually had to do a certain amount of hours either in clinic or with a lot of us did it with um, volunteering with sporting clubs. So mm. 
And I remember the taping capabilities of one Natalie Sabag were really? top, notch, top shelf. <laughs> um, I, I remember a few hamstring rub downs as well, which were fantastico. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a wonderful time. Uh, it feels like literally a lifetime ago, but um, since then we've we've had the I've had the pleasure of you being able to work on my body and tune it up. And I actually think about it. Um, quite quite often because I've been to see a number of different uh body work specialists over the time and um I just feel the way you've been able to tune in to the body's senses and the way it can create a like you can tap into how to center that body with I'm sure the skills and the uh the, the everything that you're going to talk about um, moving forward, it's been quite an incredible experience for me to be able to a witness it, but b experience it, um, being in the guidance of your hands. So thank you, Maddie. Well, thank you for allowing me to, or entrusting me with, with that as well, because I think it's something as osteopaths we don't take for granted that people come to us because they trust us, mm -hmm. and we want to be able to create that safe space for them on the table, but also while they're coming into the treatment room for a treatment and an experience it's what happens outside of the room so yeah. once you walk out of the room that's you know even more important than what happens while you're on the table and so it's about it's a I think our role as practitioners as osteopaths you know hopefully it's across all modalities is to allow our patients the people on our table to connect with their own Ability to heal themselves and to have a deeper understanding of their body and how it functions but also the other elements at play you know whether it's gut whether it's mind psychology but also you know spirituality and all that and encompassing all of those and we're all different so we all have had different life experiences and we all have different interests and it's going to evolve. So back when you were on that footy field as a 19-year-old, where you are now as a 41-year-old married with two kids, learning and understanding how our bodies move and work is very different as once we're in our 40s. The creeks right. get a little bit louder and um, we get a little bit slower, but it's understanding that and we all have that capability to be healthy and it's all already within us and our role as osteopaths is to not fix anything but allow you to have that relationship with your own body to to heal itself yeah i absolutely love that and uh, th th there's a couple of questions i, I just want to pick up um from there that have come up for me one is what what role do you feel trust in the relationship between a practitioner and a patient plays in the healing process and this doesn't need to be backed up by science or anything like what's your intuitive um sense or feeling about this intuitively i think it's huge like if i'm going somewhere whether it's an osteopath a hairdresser or an electrician if i don't trust them mm. you know you know there are times where they might cut your hair a little bit off or whatever it is but if you go it happened to me <laughs> <laughs> I never went back. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's important. I think it's hugely important. Mm. You know, mm. it's that element of trust and, you know, people come to it, like especially I guess in the last few years that globally we've all experienced with um, with the pandemic. Quite, I was able, I was fortunate to be able to work um, as an essential um, service um and I was quite often the first or the only person people would see outside of the mm -hmm. outside of their home and it was really it was really an honor it was tough but it was quite a valued experience I guess as a practitioner to be out of be that support mm -hmm. um but yeah no trust I think is a huge part of it and if you don't trust what you're receiving <clears throat> And I guess there is a transaction that does happen and you want to make sure that you're, what you're providing is of benefit to the person receiving. Um, I think, yeah, trust is trust is huge in all aspects, in friendships, in any relationship. Totally. And I see this role as a relationship that I do develop 
with my patients because it's it's that healing and journey and I think you can't have that without trust between the practitioners but also trusting in the health that actually exists already. Spot on. Yeah. Hey, so Nat, for, for everyone playing at home, and um, I say everyone playing at home because me really just I doesn't have much of an idea at all. Could you talk to us about the differences between osteopathy and, and physio um, and even chiro perhaps, and then perhaps we can start to get into the nuts and bolts of, um, of what some of your therapy entails? Keeping, keeping in mind that this podcast is, is less than 15 hours long. That's exactly right. Yes, yes. Just. I will, I will do my very best and okay. I don't want I. I'll put it out there. I have. I'm an osteopath. I haven't studied chiropractic or physio. Um, from what I understand, um, physios were developed by the medical system. Um, they, I guess, you'd go to see a surgeon and they'd operate and do whatever. But then they realise there needs to be a process of rehabilitation afterwards. And right. The surgical side of things was. Uh, preoccupied with the surgical and not so much in the rehab. So physios have been around for, I think, hundreds of years. Apologies to the physios out there if I'm getting this wrong. Um, and have been instrumental in doing post-surgical rehab um, treatment in, you know, sporting injuries and have a, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that side of things. Tend to be, again, using, again, I'm probably simplifying it and um, using you know, different machines like ultrasound, um, other sort of bits of Dry needling is a... Yeah, and dry needling is an interesting one because there are some osteopaths also that use some dry needling and my mm. therapist. Um, Cairo and osteo probably have a little bit more of an overlap. So they were both developed in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s in America. Mm. Um there's a bit of conjecture in terms of whether the founder of chiropractic was a student of osteo. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, I'm pretty sure it's BJ, ooh, BJ Palmer, I think. I'm not sure. The chiro side of it. We'll, we'll fact check that. There's there's a lot of misinformation here, so we're going to make sure that we fact check. <laughs> Google the kids. Um, That's right. And so this from the chiropractic side of things, they tend to focus on the spine and the central nervous system being the central part of the body and relating things to the spine. Um, and then we've got osteopaths who are looking at the body as a whole functional unit, so not look isolating one part of the body from the other and having the understanding that the body has its own self-healing mechanisms. Mm. And the, the tricky part is that while they're three distinct professions and different um, there's a lot of overlap between the professions and then also within the professions there's a lot of difference. So I have friends who treat really quite differently to the way I treat but we're still osteopaths and I think that's the beauty of, you know, the the modality or the modality that you know, we can share <clears throat> things and there's overlap but there's also we have our own individual style and, and interests that have taken us down a different path, I guess. So that, that, that kind of leads me to, uh, you know, the, the particular style of osteopathy that you do practice that I've had uh, tremendous success with being a patient. Um, and that's the, the field in, uh, and, and feel free to correct me if I'm mispronouncing it, but it's a bit of a tongue twister. It's biodynamic uh, um, cranial osteopathy or something like that. Something like that. So nice. we look yeah, so we have, there are a few, they're, they're just words, I guess. So okay. the biodynamic approach to osteopathy or traditional osteopathy, um, you've also got osteopathy in the cranial field. So it is definitely something, so as we discussed, touched on earlier, that I have had as a junior sports person and also just an interest in sport. Um, and the way we were taught at uni was quite different to how I'm treating now. So. Mm. Yes, that came from exposure to uh, other osteopaths um, that sort of introduced some different styles of treatment approach to me while I was at uni. And so the idea of being able to treat babies and children um, was really quite appealing to me. I'm 
yeah, so just working through that. So, yeah, I've been really fortunate through some of the osteopaths that I met along the way on the Gold Coast in Sydney to who opened up a few different um, avenues really and that was with um, Dr Jealous in America with his biodynamic approach. But a lot of the important thing with him, with Dr Jealous, is that he was really um, adamant that this is not a treatment protocol, it's not a list of techniques that we do it's actually a principle of treatment mm. so that is really important we're using the osteopathic principles to treat that's uh mm. that's really interesting yeah and so you can just to simplify it a little bit rub and crack oh you can do the what's called the cranial where you just sit and hold someone's head or their leg or whatever it is but it actually with that biodynamic approach for me, the way I see it is that it doesn't really matter what treatment or technique you're applying. If you've got the in the background and the foreground the principles of osteopathy, it doesn't matter what you do. So it, so you can um, do an adjustment or a manipulation, however you want to do it on someone's back or neck. But if you're coming from that space of wholeness, looking at musculoskeletally, blood flow, blood drainage, lymphatic system, if you're applying those principles, it doesn't matter. You're coming from that space of wholeness. Mm. So when when so coming from a holistic um, place of treatment, are there um, tests or measures that you take so that you actually know which avenue to, to walk to 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 walk down like even just what you said then if you're um you know because because i can imagine um and i think this is becoming bigger and bigger even in my field as well in the mental health field you know where where people are looking not to just treat a symptom but to get to the root cause of it so that a you've got education whether it's in the in the body or in the mind so they know why these symptoms are occurring b here are the treatment protocols and here's the prognosis so that you can go and heal yourself as well you know um so when you're doing your work are you taking some of your patients through some initial tests um albeit blood pressure or strength tests as well before you actually start to work on the treatment yeah it's, again it's a case-by-case case thing and i think you touched on a really important thing so one of the my, principles of osteopathy is or dr still who's the founder of osteopathy he talks about how um to find health should be the objective of the doctor because anyone can find a disease so mm, we live in a world where syndrome or this disease or that's wrong and that's wrong but what we want to do is to address cause and find out what's behind a lot of the symptoms and you know we whether it's mental health or you know osteopathy we've got a blanket term whether it's depression or sciatica or headache but not all patients present in the same way so I guess a lot of it comes down to the story the storytelling the questions that we ask the patients um getting the information so it's Osteopathy is a sensory experience, as I'm sure with them in the mental health field as well. It's not just a, it's not black and white. It's a sensory experience where you're listening to people, how they're talking. You learn what sort of questions, what, what sort of questions to ask. Sometimes, yep. I don't know, Paulie might be able to elaborate as a patient, but I might ask, he might, a patient might present with an ache or pain today but sometimes i'll ask well what happened 24 48 72 hours ago mm-hmm. well it might seem unrelated um there quite often might be a little bit of a, a story um and asking all those relevant qu- questions because we're looking at it holistically so looking at the system so i might ask about the gastrointestinal system mm. and um, well-being hormones for women you know the menstrual cycle as well history of trauma whether it's a you know a sprained ankle that happened when you were eight years old in the playground and it may be you know the body stores and remembers certain things it might not be an issue may have been addressed in that moment but later down the track it may be um something that presents itself um yep 
be it's a layering thing too so it's not necessarily just one thing but yes we do in terms of the other question in terms of testing we do learn how to take blood pressures do neurological exams so if someone's presenting with neurological symptoms we'll go run through um some testing and I'm also, you know, if someone is presenting in a way that I'm like, just doesn't make sense, I am more than happy to refer on to GP specialists because I think it's important. It's a, it, when you say holistic approach, it's also about the team. We're so fortunate to yeah. live the time that we've got that support medically. And while osteopathy might be considered, or, you know, inverted commas, an alternative medicine. Is it really? I didn't even, Wow. Oh, I, 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 out of pre-research for this, I, I actually Googled and when it, on the second, maybe second or third line, it states that osteopathy is quackery. What? No way. So while, um, yeah. Wow. So, um, so there's still a lot for the general public to learn and even for us as osteopaths to be able to communicate. But, yeah, we definitely have great relationships with GPs and specialists and are more than happy and important to refer on when you know our scope of works is limited. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe if I can touch on a little bit about Dr. Still, who was the founder of osteopathy. He was actually a medical physician in the um, mid mid to late eighteen hundreds, mid eighteen hundreds during the Civil War. And he, sadly, he lost his wife and four of his five children in the space of about eight years to meningitis. Oh, jeez. He, he obviously tried to treat them medically and realised that there were some limitations in what he could provide and he got obviously really upset and frustrated. Um, and after that, I think he just went on a little bit of a, I call it a walkabout, like went out in nature and just was like, what? what's going on here like what's happening and he started seeing the impacts and the effects of nature that if you go out into nature there isn't um balance harmony homeostasis within nature things don't thrive or survive mm. same with us with our bodies and we're all learning that um yeah and so that's where he did a whole big exploration back in those days things were quite different so he would take bodies out of cemeteries and do a lot of dissections and learn a lot more about the bodies and what was fundamental in his learning is the understanding appreciation and respect for an anatomy physiology biomechanics Mm. uh, biochemistry and all of that and how that impacts um and i guess i can touch on a little bit about those principles of osteopathy Mm. is that the structure of something is going to govern how it's going to function and yeah. so, so something is going to govern what its structure is going to look like so you're looking at that anatomy physiology biochemistry and even the bioelectrical fields as well and how they all interplay together to create a functional being like all of us here you know we mm. might limp around a little bit, but yeah so yeah, I can't remember if I've answered the question, but um, no, I don't know. no it's, you definitely have. Like you've you've broken down the the, the difference between uh, physio, caro, and osteo. But I I'd love to like dig into. I'll, I'll give everyone a bit of a taste of my own personal experience from a patient's perspective when I come and see you, and uh, I'll, I'll use the common threads that I experience, and then what I'd love. Obviously, if you can, to be able to uh, v- verbalise the uh, what you're experiencing from your end as a participant in this whole experience. So we come, we always have a lovely talk about life and <laughs> or, or, or all the rest of it, which is just half of the fun, really. Food, breathing. Yep. Nice. <laughs> the whole bit. Um and uh, th- then you assess me. You generally take a look at uh, me standing up, um, and y- you assess my posture, etc. Um, I lay down uh, on on your bed, which is directly behind you, right there. Um, and 
you put your hands on me, right? You put your hands uh, either under under my lower back or uh, I'm laying on my back, generally speaking. Uh, uh, you can place your hands um, under the back of my head. And if there was a camera looking at what you were doing, people would be like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's... There's actually nothing happening, you know. Like your the movement is so subtle. I could only imagine that a person from looking from the outside would be experiencing absolutely nothing, right? Um, you can put your hands on my my feet for or under uh, underneath my feet for a period of time, and what happens within my experience is I, I lose time. If I go deep, I actually go somewhere between wakeful state and being completely out cold. Uh, but I'm not in the awake state or the, the sleep state. I'm like mm. almost in an altered state. Um, and I remain there for a period of time. And I know that if I achieve that altered state, that's when the uh, the power of the medicine that you are able to hold the space for is able to do its work in its most profoundly efficient manner. Um, now that's what I experience from a patient's perspective and then I get up and I'm like, oh, that was wow. deep. <laughs> um and it was quite a trip right uh, and, and it was amazing and i feel many times i feel incre- incredibly restorative and um you know i feel like a lot of deep work has been done now from nat's perspective it's obviously a very different <laughs> story right? um i'd love to I'd love to know what your perspective is. I have a deep breath and I go to sleep while you can't see yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. Oh, That's I'm like good. I actually leave the room. <laughs> so it's a complete shadow. This, like you can't see, but there are these two hands that come through the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I have a cup of tea. No, not yeah. at all. PlayStation. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually interesting hearing your perspective. And and I, as I think you would probably can attest is that no one treatment while my hands might be in the same location no one treatment is really exactly the same no. no and so yeah definitely I usually always start with my patients standing up I and as I touched on before it's a sensory thing like while it's a touch it's more of a sense so I'm looking to see for any areas um of tightness or imbalance postural strain so you can see that just by with somebody standing just generally getting you know general movements looking for asymmetry any areas of restriction so it's a visual thing obviously it's an auditory thing too when they're listening to the story and how they're bre- and observing and listening to how they're breathing so it's when I'm assessing it's not just you know having a feel of your shoulders and um getting the side movement it's it's a little bit more than just that. It's a little bit more three, four dimensional as opposed to that two dimensional movement. And then when you're on the table, for me, whether it's a habit, I usually start from the feet because it gives me a really beautiful global perspective um, of sensing areas, you know. So I might in my head listen to the story and go, oh, okay, we need to start on that area. Sorry to interrupt, but um, I'm really happy for you to use my my body and my symptoms as a case study to be able to give the people at home a little bit more of a tangible kind of uh, experience. So just yeah, just and I, like, I'll be honest, I am actually picturing my treatments with you. So yeah. I'll quite often start off, you know, you've presented with a long history of ankle injuries, inflammation mm-hmm. um, in the feet as well mm-hmm. um, with with gout. Um, yeah. And yeah. so the impact of that, while not necessarily just locally, it's a global thing because it's an inflammatory process. Mm-hmm. So I want to be able to see what's happening in the whole body and what might present itself in my mind initially when I put my hands on. It might be, oh, no, we need to start. Quite often I'll work on the knee to mm. ease some restrictions through there. But each case it's 
it's different. And sometimes it's almost like that, <laughs> that onion peeling the layers of the onion that we might only get. Um, and I guess, Tom, with your experience with mental health too, we can't go to the core straight away. Sure. It be, it's too direct. It can be too confronting, but we need to peel those layers. And I think I've mentioned to you, Polly, before, I look at it almost like, not that I was ever a gamer, but like a, I'm thinking more snakes and ladders and Donkey Kong, but like a computer game that in the first layer we have a few little hurdles along the way and we have to learn how to adapt to those. And mm. once we learn how to adapt to those little hurdles in the first layer, the door opens to the second layer. Mm-hmm. So we've got a few of those first layers in the second layer, but some new ones have come in that second layer and we need to learn and adapt and strengthen and evolve to work through it's not about beating anything but work through those second layers and then we can open yeah. the door to the third layer and and so on and so on and in a way that's like the onions the layers of the onion i i, I just want to delve in and just ask so when you're dr- delving through these layers yeah going back to that bird's eye perspective of somebody like you appear to just simply be having your hands on me like very very delicately and it looks like nothing's happening Can you, are you able to articulate what you're experiencing, perhaps feeling as opposed to directing? I'm not sure what it is, but what is going on inside of you, the participant in this healing experience? It's a really, firstly, for me, it's an honour to be in that situation. So I take it, I don't take it for granted. So I want to respect the process. So. For me, it's also not about imposing my beliefs and what I think should change and be fixed. It's it's an observation as well, and I don't want to participate to the point where I'm doing something. I have to observe mm. and get a sense of what do you as the patient need in that moment right there. But I can think, oh, yeah, you know what? I want to get him to do that. So this goes away and that goes away because I want to be at it. I'll be honest, I'm going to take everyone's pain away, but that's not my job. Yes. So um, it, it's also really different. So I'll have times where um, I see or feel or taste things while I'm treating um, and it will be a very different experience from time to time. Sometimes I'll be like, haven't really felt much but then it was a really profound experience that quite often it's almost a similar experience how you described to it before it's almost like you know a trip it's an experience where time is has paused or it's lost like so much so I'll quite often sometimes look at the clock and go oh my goodness so much has happened and only a minute has gone by Mm. and sometimes so I'm also pushed out of it too so I don't impose I know this sounds really weird no no but I don't impose too much on the process. So, um, but I use, there's a whole world that's happening underneath. So I'm, I sort of describe it almost like the ocean that you see the surface of the ocean, but there's so much life happening underneath from, you know, the sand, the, the seaweed, the little, you know, the microscopic um creatures and the sharks and the fish and all that sort of stuff so there's so much life that's happening inside of your body and that's where it comes down to neurological lymphatic um arterial venous um blood flow drainage there's movement that's happening but at the same time while it's happening in you there's also a lot of ha- stuff happening mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. um so when so so quite often to give you um a little bit sometimes i do i see different landscapes or colors and things like that i'm not a huge sensory kind of experience but yeah we all have different experiences and quite often we share our stories as an osteopath with Mm. people but it can be um a really oh it's a beautiful it's an incredible thing it's to be able to witness power of your body changing and evolving like we've worked a lot on your nervous system and you know, you've mentioned your journey with those the the ticks and the clenching and all that sort of stuff that when you're on the treatment it all stops yeah yeah 
like mm. they don't, those clicks and uh, the the ticks and clenching it all just pauses and it's it's all like in a way floating in time mm-hmm. mm. um, the rendering so to speak yeah, yeah. and so wow. in terms of, yeah, so i might do a bit of soft tissue work move things around doing some you know move joints around as well so it's not just literally sitting there doing nothing but I am moving things around, but at the same time while moving, I'm also listening and seeing and sensing what else is happening and what by moving a particular joint, how is that impacting on the rest of the body? Because it, it will open up another doorway to something else that needs a little bit of attention. Um, wow. So often I'll feel like a little, like a, like a little tap on my, my, the back of my left shoulder or something like that um or something and is that just creating that balance again sorry i I missed that first part on your left shoulder something oh so if you're holding the if you're holding underneath my shoulders or or underneath my neck i might every so often i might feel like a little tap just just like that with one of you oh okay what but you maybe you're not even aware of it i'm not sure like i don't think i'm aware yeah got it it's interesting stuff you know sorry um for me, listening on the outside now, when, to be honest with you, when I read your bio and I read that you'd studied clinical sciences, I was expecting this podcast to be very different. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna be asking you about research methods and significant associations and 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 so forth. And I think um, this is one of the beauties of podcasting, especially when you don't know the guests. And I've just for a bit of context, this is one of the reasons why. Paulie and I banded together is because we would want we would be interested in people that the other wouldn't necessarily reach out to, not because we're not interested in, just wouldn't be in our field of perception, right? And we get people on the show, and that just blows our minds because it's just it's it's a, a, a massive surprise, you know. And I think um, for me, anyways, in coming back to your work, um, this is an area that I'm really interested in. You know, my my partner's a breathwork meditation healer. So a lot of that work is in around, um, um, you know, a, uh, a dynamic approach, a two way thing, you know, and I think, um, what, what, what it sounds like to me is you're very, um, process oriented, correct me if I'm wrong, please. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, um, you're someone who's very process oriented and wants to let the medicine work for itself, but as a, as a lovely kind of positive externality associated with that, you're having these downloads, you know, these messages. Um, and, and there's a lot of overlap with what goes on there in, in breathwork as well. And even an area that I'm really interested in, which is psychedelic research. Um, so did, when you started going into this work, did you know that that was going to, to happen? This kind of like effect that it would have on you as well, or what was that like? So it's really, I had no idea at all. Yeah. So thanks for sharing. There is, um, and with the breath work that your partner does, it's instrumental, you know, with the whole vagal tone and all that yeah. sort of stuff. It's, it's huge. We live in sympathetic overdrive and even more so after the last few years. So the breath is so important. And, you know, I can touch on later, we talk about primary respiration as well, which is different to the thoracic respiration. But mm. in terms of my whole experience, exposure to osteopathy it's one of it's weird I was 17 I finished school when I was 17 Mm. and I wanted to do being sporty background I was like oh I want to do physio and work at Wimbledon you know because I my player was too short I could just see over the net so I'm like maybe I (laughs) I was like I want to do physio and then I found out that pretty much oh not but a lot of people that I was at school with wanted to do physio I thought oh, I've just been with the same people for 13 years and they're great people all going to we're based in Melbourne Monash or Melbourne University I thought I'll do something different I had no idea so mm. car popped up biomedical science popped up and the book back in the 90s um the book we we got a big book over all the university courses so we nothing was online back then um and it was just sitting there for weeks and I just one day I just opened it up to a page that said this random word that I'd never heard of before saying osteopathy I thought oh that's a good old I'll just apply for that so wow. I, my 
experience and exposure to osteo- osteopathy was zero. So wow. I d- the two courses were RMIT or Vic Uni, and I I turned up. I had to write a two hundred and fifty words or less why I want to study osteopathy. I'm thinking I don't even know what this is. <laughs> so. Um, I think I knew someone who was studying Cairo and I, yeah, so it was, I got a little bit of external input. I don't know, but it was an interview based and um, I got interviewed at RMIT and I also got interviewed at BU, but the BU, I actually forgot that I was actually there waiting. So we're waiting for like over an hour and eventually he brought me in and, you know, the rest is history. I ended up in osteo studying at Big Uni and it was not at all like obviously the uni degree is very sort of scientific and you know by the book kind of thing and my experience at uni was amazing you know I've maintained good friendships through there and the knowledge of osteopathy is fundamental the principles of osteopathy and all the sort of different treatment modalities um but where I am now as an osteopath 20 plus years post-grad is very different um and the work that I've done isn't necessarily taught at uni it's it's quite a sensitive you need sensitive palpatry skills yeah um and experience I guess um so it's something that can come but it, it's something that should I think for all of us just in life doesn't have to be osteopathy but to have that open mind but As you were saying before, where I was pre-study, during study and now, God, it's a whole, and it's, and that whole sort of experience with the courses that Dr. Jealous runs has been not osteopathically changing, but also life-changing. It's been, there have been some schools and we've, like, those who have gone through the courses, we've all gone through really big life changes because it, it changes the patterning of how you think. It's about yes. letting go of what's right in front of you, that whole convergent perspective and being able to look more divergently. And when you go from this to this, so much stuff comes through. It's, you see so much more of your, and it's And it can be a bit unsettling. Mm. Um, yep. But once you ground up trust, coming back to the initial thing about trust, trusting in yourself but trusting in the process um yeah it's amazing stuff i just want to quickly say um something about you know viewing the individual as a as a cog in a wheel you know a cog in a system you know and i think um you know we do this in in counseling as well in the clinic we we have there there are different sorts of therapies there's one called schema therapy and ifs internal family systems which i really like when you don't view the internal world as an ego you actually view it as a system of parts that have tried to help or adapt to a world that you have inevitably lived in you know there's a little part of you that some might call the inner child there's a part of you that was the enforcer of an experience and that might present itself as armor the to, to to prevent you from pain you know anger can can prevent pain from from coming through again and, and and so forth but i think um one of the really most important points that i've found in mental health and it certainly sounds like there's overlap with with what you do as well and Polly Polly and i speak about this this sort of stuff all the time is that look at the symptom as it presents itself in its environment physical social so forth and there's a really fantastic example of this it's one of my favorite books um lost connections and in in the book johan hari talks about how in in the 1950s and so forth a lot of women would talk about their nerves and they'd go to gps and so forth and they'd say oh i'm I'm having a, a real issue with my nerves you know and viewed just as a symptom We'd started, you know, a GP would treat the the woman, you know, with with anxiety or whatever it is. But when you take a broader approach, or in other words, what you were saying, when you start to look more divergently, you start to look at some of the things they're saying. And obviously hindsight is 2020. And they're saying things like, I've got nothing to be upset about. You know, my husband makes great money. We've got a brand new washing machine. You know, we've got an amazing clothesline. We've got, you know, and now we look back on these sorts of things and go, of course, 
all these psychological needs aren't being met. Where's the autonomy? Where's the independence? Where's your sense of self? Where, you know, all these sorts of ideas. But if you just view it as a single symptom, of course, you're going to inevitably, unless there's a real clear medical illness, um, you're inevitably going to, to walk down the wrong road. And I think that's one of the biggest things that resonates with me as you're talking is to view the pain or the issue, you know, an example, Paulie's foot, what is the body doing to exacerbate these issues, you know, and then how can we affect change within the body so that the symptom, you know, as a coping strategy is no longer there. So that I think it's not not necessarily so much of a question, but I just think that's really coming through strong to me as you're, um, as you're talking. Absolutely. And I think it's so like, you know, Paulie and I have spoken about it because there are certain elements of the the gout label that aren't making sense. You know, his, you know, uric acids, acid levels are low, You'd, you know, when he's having a flare up and, you know, we have to sort of try and step back in terms of where that inflammation coming from. And, you know, there's a lot of gut stuff that we need to sort of explore. And again, I'm not a functional medicine doctor or a general practitioner or anything like that. But that's where, you know, having those contacts with other modalities that can delve deeper into that side of thing. I have a, a real general interest in that sort of stuff in terms mm. of the inflammation. There's an increase in um, autoimmune conditions over mm. the mm. um, inflammation that, you know, a lot of us, we either are going through it at the moment ourselves or we know someone who is. And it's just understanding the impact of general inflammation, stress, you know, you, you, you know, going through that with the um, mental health world. And um, and there's amazing research coming out now with all the um, psychedelics and everything, and it's fascinating. And there's partners work in um, the breath work and things that we can do. And I think there are so many things that we can do as individuals, um, but it's about having that open mind and heart to yeah. mm. Um, but also, and I'm, I've been really fortunate in that I've got some incredible people around me who know so much more than I do. And I also learn from my patients. I learn from Paul. Every treatment I do, I'm experiencing is a learning experience. And um, I think there's so much more to what's going on within an individual than necessarily a label um, while it's nice to have that label, it gives us something to work from. Yeah, we're all different, and and we're all going to respond differently as, as well. So, um, you know, I've done my own exploration in looking um, you know, after my own health in terms of dietary stuff, and yeah. you know, working on managing my stress. But, you know, <laughs> I keep throwing piles of mud at me, but you know. <laughs> um but yeah it's um but it's a whole thing you know what you do with food like I love food and cooking and being gluten dairy sugar all that free I was like what am I going to do like mm. it does impact on the social stuff but I'll make adjustments but I've also learned and adapted and there are so many things now what 20 30 years ago gluten free is very different now yeah. uh, but that's also part of a treatment too because it's not just about what I'm doing on the table. It's what the patient can learn and to take home and to make certain changes. And it's hard to shift the mindset. We know we get attached as humans, you know, ego or it's that habit of our protection. We do what feels easier and it's comfort. And yeah. there is, you know, things that we can improve and change and like I'm definitely not perfect. Um learning to make sort of small changes and, and just to be easy on ourselves as well. But it's not just what happens on that table for me. It's empowering a patient to to breathe, mm. connect with their breath, to learn what sort of triggers might be making them angry, to learn what triggers food might be causing irritation as well and exploring but um yeah yeah very, very cool uh look Nat 
been able to, uh, you know, kind of explain and uh, communicate what it is, the craft that you do, but also understanding that a person's health journey, you know, it, it can, there's so many facets associated with it and you can also play a role in your own health journey as well, like a massive role in your own health journey through so many different faculties that you take part in. But the responsibility that you have um, in your craft has been, from my experience, um, very, very powerful and, and I know many other people as well. So I want to thank you for jumping on the show and uh, having a chat to us. You were just so wonderful and so perfect uh, in, in your explanation of everything in your and your whole journey. So thank you, Nat. Thank you for having me on here. As Paulie knows, I'm uh, I'm not one to be on camera or in, or in front of the camera. They are definitely not my kind of space. But as we were just talking about, you know, life journeys, it's about learning and growing and, you know, Thank you, Paulie and Tom, for my bar. That's on the other show, I'll say. But, um, <laughs> I, um, I uh, thank you for making this first experience for me fun and enjoyable and, yeah, maybe I'll do it again. <laughs> We'd love to have you on again. Hey, hey, Nat, um, very quickly, where can um, people find you for, for more information? People want to get in touch perhaps to, to come do some work with you. Where, where can they go? So I've got, I'm based in Melbourne, so I'm in a clinic in Caulfield. So the business is called In Health Osteopathy. Um, and I guess it's quite poignant in terms of what we've been talking about is always being connected to our health. Um, and so it's inhealthosteopathy.com.au. So feel free to email me. There's a link there. You can um, either make an online booking or send me an email if you have any questions. And I'm more than happy to have a chat. Thank you so Beautiful. much for your time, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you.